Imagine you are an explorer from a far and distant world where the people know of the planet Earth only from legend and rumor and universal folklore. Is it possible there is life on Earth? What is the nature of that life? Is it true the creatures there possess this legendary thing called heart? At last, after a long voyage through time and space, you approach the mysterious, unexplored planet, and you set your carbon amino scanner for Alpha plus 11. At first, there are only the clouds of Earth, then the beautiful trees and lakes, then the long-awaited moment arrives. For the first time in the long history of the universe, you discover there is life on the planet Earth. As if the earthlings were performing some sort of tribal rite, you adjust the scanner to examine their internal parts. And there it is, the earthling heart, a muscle about the size of an earthling fist, in the middle of the chest and just a bit to the left. You notice it is beating very fast. But as you scan other earthlings in more relaxed behavior, you notice the heart beats more slowly. When earthlings relax, the heart muscle doesn't have to work as hard to keep blood flowing through the body. Obviously, exercise or excitement makes the heart beat faster. In the interest of science, you must have a closer look. Being careful not to harm the creature, who appears to be a male of the species, you activate the carbon amino transporter. There is the earthling heart, up close and personal. You observe there are miles and miles of blood vessels, hollow tubes, which reach to and from the heart to every part of the body. There are three kinds of blood vessels in the earthling body, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Blood flows from the heart into large arteries, then into smaller arteries, which branch into still smaller ones. The smallest of these arteries branch into tiny capillaries. You observe that the walls of these capillaries are very thin. So thin that nutrients from food and oxygen carried in the blood pass through the capillary walls into the cells around them. This then is the purpose of this bloodstream, to carry food energy and oxygen to all the cells of the body, cells that make up the muscles, bone, skin, nerves, and brain. Cells which combine to make the earthling move and think. But the flow is circular, always in one direction through a closed system. Vessels called veins carry the blood back to the heart, first from the small capillaries into larger and larger veins until the blood flows back into the heart again. You feel you're getting closer to the mysteries of the earthling heart. It is really a pump. It pumps the blood through the creature's body. You can actually hear the pump working. And you can feel it too, next to the windpipe and on the inner side of the earthling's wrist. Every time the heart beats, there's a little pulse 
a movement. This specimen's pulse rate is about 80 times a minute. Your computer projects this is about normal for the species. Then you observe another important thing about the heart and the bloodstream. Two organs, the function of which you had observed earlier when the earthling was shouting his strange loud noises, called lungs. But now you know they have another function. When the earthling breathes, the oxygen moves through the lungs into the bloodstream. Then it is pumped by the heart throughout the body. Now you see something else about this ingenious pump, the heart. Inside there are four chambers. A wall separates the two chambers on the left from those on the right. On each side of the heart, blood flows from the upper chamber to the lower chamber through valves. After the blood passes through, the valves snap shut to keep the blood from backtracking. Blood entering the right side of the heart has just returned from its trip around the body. It is a dark bluish color because it has given up its oxygen to the cells. Blood entering the left side is bright red because it has just returned from the lungs where it received a fresh supply of oxygen. The earthling stirs. It is time to transport him back. Now you remember the legends. The curious notion that the earthling heart is often filled with a thing called love. A very strange. What is this thing, love? And where in the heart can it be found? Using the carbon amino scanner, you search for love. It must be there, but your instruments cannot track it down. Perhaps it's something of more than three dimensions. As you activate the carbon amino transporter and send the earthling home, you realize there are mysteries here beyond the capacity of your highly advanced intellect and technologies to solve. And so, you set your course on a heading that will lead you past the Milky Way and home again. There is life on this planet crawler. And the legendary power of the Earthling heart to sustain life and to give love is real. with Charles. I don't know, Doctor. I just found him. Can you find out? Dr. Abel, mm -hmm. the research will have to wait. Well, of course. Why, it's Charles. Wow. I've never seen so many instruments. They're here to help us learn all we can about staying healthy. Do you think they can help Charles? I don't know why he's sick. We will find out. I have a new process that just might be perfect. Really? Dr. Abel, mm -hmm. activate the reducer. Right away. The process involves reducing myself to microscopic size. I'll enter his bloodstream and examine him internally. I'll operate the reduction equipment and follow Dr. Trousseau on this electronic map. We'll talk over these micro-communicators. Do I have everyone's complete and total confidence? Yes. Uh-huh. Ah! Dr. Abel, begin the reduction.
Doctor, are you safe? Certainly. Prepare for injection. Great. Now beam power so I can move. This blood vessel looks smaller than it should be. Dr. Abel, will you take his blood pressure? Hmm, I was right. It is smaller, and that means higher blood pressure. Correct. That's unusual for a boy his age. Exactly. We're on to something, but we need to know more. The passages in the capillaries are smaller, too. That puts stress on the whole body and reduces the amount of oxygen to the cells. Yes, blood color is dark, which means a low oxygen level. Trousseau, what happened? Where are you? Down here, doctor. I just took a ride down the arteries and the legs. No fat buildup on the vessel walls. That's good. That would really be unusual. Isn't that hardening of the arteries? Right. We think it may have its beginnings at a young age in boys and girls who don't eat properly. Charles checks out okay. I have a hunch what's wrong, but I need more clues. Beam me more power. I'm entering a muscle cell. Okay, but you'll need your port pack to get out. I can't beam power into the cells. Muscle shows lowered oxygen level. You and Charles are active, aren't you? Sure. Can you tell that from the muscle? Oh, yes. I can tell he gets all kinds of exercise, and pretty often, too. That's good. Yeah. We like to ride bikes and jump ropes. Trousseau, you're almost out of power. Move out. Fix coordinates. I'll attempt a hyperthrust. Doctor, where are you? I can't beam you power until I know your location. Power to the stomach. Now, please. There he is. <sighs> well, we've got to solve this one. Stomach walls show irritation, colors off, low oxygen here too. Doctor, was it something he ate? I don't think so, but diet is important. Charles and I like fresh fruits and vegetables, and we learn to go for low-fat dairy products too. Good, but even when you're active, you can still overeat. The right kinds of food and the right amount of food is the way to take care of your body. So you think Charles ate too much? No, the clues point to something else. Abel, while I check the intestines, you review the clues. I have a pretty good idea already, but let's be sure. We found that blood pressure is up, oxygen level is low, stomach lining is irritated. It points to one thing. Dr. Trousseau, any intestine problems? No. Just as I thought. Two more places to check. You take his pulse again while I check the heart. I'm looking for birth defects, like badly formed valves, holes between chambers, or abnormal heart rhythms. Right. If the heart's not working right, it could be dangerous. Dr. Abel, I'm inside. Inside a working human heart. It's incredible. No leaky valves here, and the blood flow is really powerful. Does Charles have anything wrong with his heart? No, his heart is healthy. We have one more place to check. Right. I'll ride the pulmonary artery to the lung. You could be drowned in the swift current or get lost in the maze of air sac. Yes, but I'll have the color of the blood to guide me. As the lungs clean the blood, the fresh oxygen makes the color change from dark to bright red. Blood going into the lungs is dark. Blood coming out of the lungs is bright. Keep the power beam on me. There it is, all right. Smoke. Coming from the lungs. <coughs> well, I've got to move out. I <coughs> can't see. <coughs> can't breathe. Abel, <coughs> get me out. I've lost him. I gotta zoom in. Ah, there he is. Full power. Oh, I made it. Is, is Charles awake yet? Take a look. Charles, you're okay. Oh. I think your body was telling you not to start smoking. Smoking? We found all the symptoms and the smoke that stayed in his lungs. Smoking caused all those problems? I was only trying them. Smoke is like poison. Blood pressure goes up, 
pulse increases, sensitive areas are irritated, and oxygen levels go down. Even if you feel all right, these bad things are happening. We've got friends who asked us to smoke. What do you say if they ask you to smoke again? No, thanks. I do not smoke. Dr. Abel, I think this mystery is solved, and Charles has learned an important lesson. Yep. My body knew not to smoke before I did. Ready for a bike ride, Charles? Well, I guess we can try. Thanks, Dr. Truso, Dr. Abel. I'm going to go inhale some good, clean air. Oh, fine. Right. That's what he is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to smoke that. Either. Fun. We all love to have fun. Whether it's running, playing soccer, swimming, bicycling, jumping rope, playing basketball, or skating, they're all fun. And one way to have more fun is to be in good condition, to be physically fit. Because when we're fit, we look better, feel better, and we can do the things we like to do better and longer. But what do we mean by being fit? Do we mean the shape of our bodies? Or how big our muscles are? Is it how we look? Not necessarily. Being physically fit means that our bodies are healthy and strong. And being healthy and strong depends upon something that can't be seen. It depends on everything in our body being healthy. But mostly, it depends on our heart being healthy. Let's take a look at how we can make our heart strong and healthy and why it's important to keep it that way. Right now, our hearts are pumping blood all through our bodies to our muscles to give them energy from the food we eat and oxygen from the air we breathe. Our muscles depend on our heart and the blood it pumps. So, the better our hearts work, the better our bodies can work. When you play basketball or ride your bike really fast, your muscles have to work harder. And the harder they work, the more oxygen and energy they need. When you do something that doesn't take much effort, like sitting quietly, your muscles don't work as hard, so your heart can beat very slowly to supply the oxygen your body needs. Different things make your muscles do different amounts of work and cause your heart to beat faster or slower. You can feel your heart beating by taking your pulse. One way to take your pulse is to gently put your finger on the artery in your neck. Can you feel the blood as your heart pumps it through your body? Every time you feel something moving under your finger, it's your heart beating, pumping blood to your muscles. The number of times your heart beats in a minute is called your heart rate. If you are reading or sitting still, it beats between 70 and 80 times per minute. If you're jumping or running, it can beat as fast as 180 times a minute. The more work your muscles do, the more energy and oxygen they need. That means your heart must beat faster to pump more blood, and that gives us a higher heart rate. Your heart always knows how much energy and oxygen the muscles need, so it always knows how fast it must beat to pump the right amount of blood to them. But every heart doesn't pump the same amount of blood per beat, and the amount of blood a heart pumps per beat tells us whether the heart is healthy or unhealthy. So if two people, who are about the same size, were doing the same thing, say, aerobic dancing, their muscles would be using about the same amount of energy and oxygen. But if one had a healthy heart and one didn't, the unhealthy heart would have to beat many more times than the healthy heart to give the muscles what they need. Just think how much harder the unhealthy heart would have to work during a whole day of basketball and swimming and even reading. Over twice as hard. A healthy heart pumps more blood, so it can pump slower and doesn't have to work as hard. If a person has a lower heart rate, they probably have a healthy heart. They are what we call heart healthy. And if they are heart healthy, they can feel better and may live longer. Now how can we make ourselves heart healthy? And how can we stay that way? One way is to get the right kind of exercise. 
the kind of activity that is called aerobic. We call an exercise aerobic if it makes us breathe deeper and our hearts beat faster. The first part of aerobic sounds like air. That's because aerobic means in oxygen, which comes from the air we breathe. Running, jumping, swimming, playing soccer, and even fast walking are all good aerobic exercises because they strengthen our heart. Some things we do are good exercises, but they aren't aerobic. Lifting weights or doing push-ups will make us stronger. Baseball or volleyball are fun, and they will improve your coordination. But none of them are aerobic, so they won't help our hearts. But even good aerobic exercises won't keep our hearts healthy if we don't do them regularly, at least three times a week for 20 minutes. And we have to keep doing them even when we become adults. We must also be careful of what we put into our bodies. Fatty foods or cigarettes are bad for you because they can make you look bad and feel bad. And because they can make your heart work harder than it has to. They can keep your heart and you from being healthy. So if we get plenty of aerobic exercise, eat the right foods and don't smoke, we can keep our hearts and our bodies healthy and strong. And if our hearts are healthy and strong, we may live longer and feel better to do the things we like to do. Being heart healthy makes life a lot more fun. Here lies Eldon Finney. He filled life's cup and drank it up. Now there isn't any. There was a chill in the air that November afternoon I first visited Eldon Finney's grave. A small cold wind moaned through the lengthening shadows. I made a note in my diary that it was as quiet as a graveyard. My name? Manderville Names. Private Eye. Student of human nature. Observer of reality seeker of truth. Sure, I'd heard of Eldon Finney. Who hadn't? His strange life was a constant item in the gossip columns. But now, it was his strange death that concerned me. As I stood by his grave, a single question burned in my mind. Who, I wondered, or what, had killed Eldon Finney. Of course, I had a theory. In every photograph of Eldon Finney, there was this beautiful, mysterious woman in the background. Through my sources, I learned her address. slowly inward. A 
note was passed out the door. It was written in a woman's hand. Suddenly, I was face to face with the mysterious woman in the photographs. Sure. I knew Eldon. I was his cook, and it wasn't an easy job. Trouble was, Eldon believed everything anybody told him about food and nutrition. He believed in every kind of fad diet that came along. It was not a pretty story. Like many of us, Eldon confused media hype with absolute truth. When an advertisement on television or in a magazine claimed its fatty, sugary food product was wonderfully good for your health, he believed him. Eldon's idea of a proper meal was a sweet roll, potato chips, and a cola. A candy bar for dessert. Well, after all, the advertisers of these things claimed that they could do everything from making you sexy to preventing cancer. So he had me prepare all of this stuff for him. He ruined my reputation as a gourmet cook. I hated him for it! But I didn't kill him. Well, a mysterious woman had a motive, and the opportunity. Since she prepared his gourmet snack food, it would have been easy for her to poison her employer. But I had another idea, a hunch. The cook had mentioned Eldon's physical fitness trainer, a certain Swami powerlifter called Baba Bubba. Eldon Finney wouldn't listen to reason. He was convinced that the way to health was to do every kind of exercise there was. He had all these books and magazine articles on exercise. One would suggest a weightlifting program. Another would push jogging. Another speed walking. Another hanging upside down from a doorway. And then another would suggest and swear that break dancing was the way to improve your body. Then he'd read another article that would say doing absolutely nothing was good for your health. There's a place for these things. Each can be effective for specific people in specific circumstances. But Eldon believed everything people said or wrote about exercise was meant just for him. He couldn't decide what was best. So he did them all. Eight hours a day, he lifted, he danced, he jogged, he meditated. He hung upside down from a doorway. It wrecked his body, and it wrecked my business. People would look at this physical wreck and say, get a load of Baba Bubba's buddy's body, and they'd be out of here. There was one more angle to this affair. As a student of human nature, observer of reality, seeker of truth, I instinctively felt I should explore the house where Eldon Finney had lived his strange, wild life. I passed through the patio. It was filled with empty snack food boxes, candy wrappers, fad diet literature. Then, I spotted a face in a window. I remembered from my notes it was Sigmund, the butler. 
certainly a prime suspect. For here was a man with a precise knowledge of Eldon's curious lifestyle. People think of Eldon as a trendsetter. It's absolutely false. He was a follower. His lifestyle mirrored those lifestyles that he saw on the television and uh, in the magazines. Uh, he really had no mind of his own. Uh, he was the macho man in the beer commercials, uh, the sophisticate in the cigarette ads, uh, the adventurer on the liquor billboards, and the young hog in the cola commercials. Oh, he was everything to everybody but himself. He couldn't decide who he was or what his lifestyle was supposed to be. And so others made that decision for him. He became what they said that he should be. To the end, he had no identity of his own. For a while, I lingered in Eldon's garden, a bit saddened by what I had learned. How strange this world of ours. We're subjected to such powerful ideas by such skillful people. People who want to convince us their point of view is correct. They tell us how and what we should eat, how we should keep our bodies fit, how we should live our lives. And often what they tell us is wrong. Sometimes what they tell us is even bad for our bodies, our minds, or our health. And if we listen to them, if we let them make our decisions in life for us, we lose control of our lives a little. We become puppets, our strings pulled by strangers. Who killed Eldon Finney? Not the gourmet snack food cook. Not Baba Bubba, the Swami powerlifter. It was not Sigmund the butler. And it wasn't society to blame. For we all are our own persons. Each of us has the freedom and the intelligence and the plain old common sense to make our own decisions about what's good for us and what's not. But Eldon gave this most important human right away and there's no one to blame but himself. Life, of course, goes on. The parade of days marches beautifully by. Each of the characters in our drama will build a new and promising life. I, Manderville Nails, continue my distinguished career as private eye, student of human nature, observer of reality, and seeker of truth. And you, I'm certain, will become more and more the author of your own lives. Not a character designed by others, but the bold, imaginative, and independent person only you can create. On a faraway planet, beyond the stars we can see from our windows, a time traveler awakened after a long time sleeping. She stirred, gathered her nerve and her wits about her, then rose to see what kind of world she stumbled upon. 
and what kind of people lived there. Just as she was deciding the place was deserted and all the people had wandered away, she heard a sound. The sound of a musical instrument. And then another. What a peculiar music! And then, suddenly, there they were, the people. Not too much unlike herself, but wandering aimlessly in circles, dressed all alike, wearing no shoes, tooting their awful tunes. How sad, the time traveler thought to herself. How sad to live on a planet where the music had no melody. Why aren't you playing a melody? We can't. Don't you know any melodies? We, we, we know lots of melodies. Then why don't all of you play one? We just can't. We, 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 we'd have to decide on a song. And we don't know how to choose. You don't know how to... choose? The time traveler had encountered a civilization which couldn't make up its mind. Couldn't make a decision. They didn't know how. They walked in circles because they couldn't decide where to go. They wore no shoes because they couldn't decide between boots or slippers or penny loafers. And there was no melody to their music because they couldn't decide on a song. Someone must make decisions. Your leader, your king, who's in charge? We have no leader. No, no, no king either. We couldn't decide on one. The time traveler couldn't believe what she was hearing. There must be someone on this planet who could make a decision, and she would find that person. <laughs> So she set out to explore the entire planet in her search. But all she could find was more of the same boring, colorless world. Even the animals were bored and boring. In one valley, she encountered a huge, yawning Yakosaurus. No one could ever remember seeing it awake. And everywhere she went, there were more people, all walking around in circles and not a decision maker to be found. Time travelers have never been able to resist fooling around with people's civilizations. Our time traveler was no exception. She decided she'd have to teach the people to assert themselves, to make decisions, to exercise their right to express what they think and feel or believe, to be in charge of their own lives, Without these things, one cannot really be alive at all. The days are flat and colorless and dull, without dreams, without joy, without pride. She told them about her world, which was so different from their own, full of color and variety, a place where decisions had been made, a place of exciting choices. But she also told them of the dangers in making the wrong choices and how hard it may be to resist what others try to get us to do. And then she told them that everyone has a right to choose, to refuse, to say no. But no one quite understood a world like the time travelers. They had never ever thought of such things before. So she decided to take several of the people to the valley of the yawning Yakasaurus. Now, suppose I were to tell you to follow me into the mouth of this great sleeping beast. What would you do? I don't know. I, I, I suppose we'd follow you. You're in charge, I guess. We'd do whatever you say. We, we, we wouldn't want to make you angry. Is that what you want us to do? Don't you see what I'm trying to show you? Each individual person is in charge of his or her own life. Each has a right to choose, to make decisions. 
in his or her own best interest. If you don't want to go where it's dangerous, you can refuse. If you don't want to take a dare, you don't have to. Everyone has a right to say no. And yes, sometimes it will be difficult to stand up to other people, like when you're refusing to take a dare. But if you feel deep inside that something is not good for your health or for your safety or for your happiness, you have a right to refuse. The greatest joy in my world comes from making these decisions. Making life all it can be and making decisions that are right for me. Saying no to situations that are dangerous or unhealthy. Saying yes to all the great possibilities around us. And exploring and experiencing the beautiful things of the world. You can say no and you can say yes. And both can be decisions that will determine how full your lives will be. You can decide whether your lives will be noise or music. For several weeks, the time traveler stayed among the people, teaching them the fine art of decision making. She showed them how to identify problem situations and how to think about realistic ways to solve them. How to analyze choices choose the best option among several choices, how to act on that choice and evaluate the results, how to say yes or no and mean it and feel good about it. And little by little, she became aware of a change in the lives of the people. No longer were they unable to make up their minds between boots or slippers or penny loafers or anything else for that matter. They had become masters of their own lives captains of their own futures. Each of them had emerged from the crowd as an individual with the power and potential to make his or her own decisions, to make their own way. But the greatest change of all in the lives of the people of the faraway planet, beyond the stars we can see from our windows, took place in their music. Instead of the wandering, unstructured, joyless noise, something new and vibrant and exciting happened. And then the time traveler became aware of a new sound. For the first time in their history, the people of the planet were not playing the same instrument, but different instruments, deliberately choosing as individuals to play musically. For the first time in their lives, there was choice. And in their music, there was melody and harmony. Thanks to the time traveler, her new friends had learned how to make decisions. Their lives were full of exciting, fun choices that had changed their world forever.